Genesis chapter 16, we're calling this one Sire and Ishmael, and I'll explain what that means at the end of the lesson, but I think it'll become obvious as we work through this chapter. Acts 17.11 reminds us to trust but verify, receive the word with all eagerness, examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. Now let's ask God to go before us. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us and commands us to immerse ourselves in the words of Torah. Sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouths. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. So for having only 16 verses, there's just a lot of action in this chapter, and, and the words can seem more sour than sweet, but the sweetness will come in, in learning God's lesson and uh, you know studying what, what God would have us do. William Schlager uh, summarizes this chapter by saying, despite the promises made in chapter 15, in chapter 16, we see what can happen when we get impatient with God. So Abraham went into Hagar and she became pregnant. This leads to strife between Sarah and Hagar and Hagar decides to flee. God tells her that Ishmael will be blessed, although he will be a wild ass of a man, and that she should return to uh, her, her master, Sarah. And so that's kind of the, the theme of the chapter. And of course, there's just a lot to unpack as we work through it. Um, Abraham has several decision points that he makes in this chapter. Uh, we can look at it and say, well, he did the wrong thing. But, you know, take a step back and, and put yourself in his shoes. The promise had happened many years ago. There was no son. And, you know, here's a, a culturally acceptable method of um, of having a child, just, just like we would adopt a child or up for artificial insemination today when when natural methods you know aren't aren't there so uh that respect you know it, it was okay to do but was he trusting in god and you know and, and all those kind of questions also paul will pick up on this theme in galatians unfortunately an in-depth study it's, it's very complex argument what he's doing but basically he uses hagar versus sarah and ishmael versus uh the promised son isaac as typological models as instructions for us and and so the greater our understanding of chapter 16 through 21 in genesis the better we will be able to follow paul's really rather complex arguments so uh, these uh, these these chapters upcoming are really worth our study we aren't told exactly where Hagar, Sarah, and Abram are in, in, in the beginning, but we're told that the angel meets uh, Hagar along the way of Shur, and that is down here. So safe to say they were probably uh, up here in uh, Beersheba, and then Hagar, when she flees, she is heading back to Egypt, which is where she, she came from. Uh, we aren't sure where Barad is. There's a verse at the end that says it's, it's between Barad and Kadesh. Kadesh is likely biblical Kadesh Barnea down down here. Um, and that is a name that we should all know and remember because Kadesh Barnea is going to be the location where the 12 spies enter into the land. And this is the episode where uh, they go in for 40 days, 10 spies come back with a bad report. They're scared. They spread fear throughout the camp and basically a, a rebellion ensues that God is not at all pleased with. Joshua and Caleb are the two spies that bring back the good report. And it's interesting that they're from the tribes of Ephraim and Judah respectively because those are the two power tribes as we move into the time of the, the monarchy. Um, up here in Gerar, you see this mention of Hagar um, on the map here. That is probably referencing Genesis 21, uh, where Abraham will officially cast out Hagar and Ishmael after Isaac is born. But uh, we have a lot to cover of Abraham before then, so let's, let's move into Genesis 16. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not borne him a child, but she had an Egyptian slave woman whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please have relations with my slave woman. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So a maidservant in, in that day was a legal extension of her owner. So legally and technically, uh, this procedure Sarai su is suggesting would have counted as, as Sarai's offspring. Um, and in Sarah's defense, you, you know, she says, see, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So she was probably feeling the weight 
like she was the one responsible for the unfulfilled promise. So she was heading into the end of her childbearing years, if not already past them from from a natural perspective. And so she probably felt guilty. Um, and so she's, you know, she she knows Ab- Abram's gotten this promise, and you know she's she's trying to help here. So let's let's give her a, a little bit of charity, and she's trying to do the right thing. Going into someone who's not your wife just sounds really really bad to us uh, today. But Sarah's logic is is actually no different than adoption. So when you've got two surrogate parents who are involved with the conception, um, but the child be belongs to someone else, or artificial insemination where one parent uh, is is involved, it, it's it's kind of that thinking. It's it's a way to build a family when natural methods fail. So that's just it's perfectly. It sounds strange to our day, but uh, it, it was an acceptable practice back then. However, uh, we can clearly see that Sarai is showing a lack of faith. It is God's prerogative to open closed wombs if He so chooses. So uh, you know, I'm a little bit sympathetic with with Sarai because they did not have this rich tradition of biblical lessons to fall back on like we do. But um, it it is a lack of faith because she was a party to the promise and uh, and kind of failed at this step here. So the text doesn't say that Satan prompted Sarai to to do this, but I can't help seeing a lot of parallels between Eve and Sarai. Um, the decision in any case was not from God. So at least in an indirect sense, uh, anything that's not from God probably comes from the enemy, especially when it seems like a good idea at the time, but then turns out horribly wrong. So God is the one who spoke through Adam and Abraham. Satan is the one who spoke through Eve, and then we could say indirectly Satan prompted uh, Sarai, if we want to look at it from a spiritual perspective. Adam listened to Eve, even though he knew what God said about eating from the tree of life. Uh, Abram listened to Sarah, even though he knew what God had said about offspring. So the, the temptation to take the easy path was just too great for both Adam and, and Abram. Um, and now the contrast is, of course, Jesus was also offered the easy path, and he refused. So he was tempted in every respect like we were, but uh, he remained sinless. So this is the fifth of the ten tests of Abraham. And specifically, it, it's the wait for a son and his marriage to Hagar. That was the test. So the test wasn't directly Sarah presenting Hagar as option B. It was the whole process of waiting. And so um, after doing really well in chapters 13 through 15, Abraham, you know, doesn't doesn't do so hot in this chapter. He makes a mistake here by agreeing. You know, he listens to his wife and, instead of listen to God. That's you know, step one. And then possibly we'll dig into how he handles this conflict between uh, Sarai and Hagar. That could be another area where he, he might have blown it a little bit. So again, although that method of childbearing was a reasonable option that day in Abraham case in Abraham's case I would say it's different because he was given the specific promise by God um, you know, this may have seemed like a good idea at the time but he should have listened to God's voice we have no record of him praying about this going to the altar that he built bringing this before the Lord even you know in the last chapter we saw he he kind of haggles a little bit and says God you know where's this promise he doesn't do that here he keep apparently you know we we get the feeling he could have asked God you know what's up and God would have answered him but he didn't right he acted in the flesh and whenever we doubt God we act in the flesh there's this phrase sire and Ishmael and I think a lot of us have a little a lot of little Ishmaels running around because of times where we didn't wait on God and we took matters into our own hand. So it's this phrase, just because you can doesn't mean you should. The the arrangement, like adoption today, like artificial insemination today, is available. But in this case, um, God needed, Abraham needed uh, to follow the higher standard than the, than the society around him. And just as we need to follow higher standards today. We've talked about this uh, with Lot and with Eliezer, but the, the divine narrator is going out of his way to tell us the geographic origin of these people. And it seems that wherever Abraham goes, he accumulates people, which you, you think is a good thing. But then if we look at times where he was in obedience versus times where maybe he was being disobedient and the people he pick up d- tend, tend to be a bit of a problem. So in Haran, that's where he picked up Lot. And remember, the instruction was to get out 
of your country, away from your your kindred. So he was supposed to go directly to Canaan, do not pass go, do not collect $200, but he stops off in Haran with his father and um, you know accumulates people and 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 wealth and 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 that kind of thing so he wasn't supposed to be in haran he picks up lot lot tends to be a source of grief for abraham now in damascus is where he picks up uh, eleazar now damascus was when he was doing the right thing lot had been captured by the four kings of mesopotamia Abraham chases them all the way to Dan and then chases them further up to Damascus. And he picks up Eleazar, who is from Damascus. Eleazar in Genesis 24 will turn out to be a, a very blessing, very much of a blessing to him. Um, and we'll, again, we'll see that in Genesis 24. And then we're told here that the, the Hagar, the Egyptian slave woman, is from Egypt. And as we talked about, uh, you know, God told him to go to Canaan, not Egypt. So going from here to Egypt uh, when there was a drought shows a lack of faith in God's promises again. And so probably no coincidence that a lack of faith in God's promises drives him to Egypt. He gets in hot water with Pharaoh and and his his wife, and he picks up this uh, kind of a symbol of his lack of faith, this Hagar, and that's just, this is where he picks up <laughs> uh, this, this servant is in Egypt. So Hagar's offspring and Sarah's offspring have been clashing ever since. So this is a, a millennia you know, struggle resulted from this bad decision that Abraham made. So Abram wasn't patient. He, he didn't practice self-control, but we're told the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So in other words, when God has given us a promise, we need to wait on him. Uh, having goals and aspirations are great things if they're consistent with God's purpose for our lives. But again, we have to be consistent to wait on him to bring those purposes to fruition. Now, it's it's tough because we're given an intellect and we're given creativity and you know we can solve problems. And um, but the problem is, if there's something that God has placed on our heart and we get out in front of him, that's only going to mess things up. It, it's totally natural to ask, is there something I'm missing, something that I should be doing? Um, but to go out and do it without praying on it, I think, is where we get into trouble. If, if God opens a door, then I'll go through it. But I'm learning every day to be more and more content. The problem is there may be open doors that God hasn't opened. And that was Abraham's test here. So we need to make sure that we're moving out only when God says to move out. And so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave woman, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. So not a full status wife. Hagar is more like a, a concubine, a lower class, lower status. So this is not viewed as polygamy in, in that, that kind of sense. Um, note that 10 years had passed. You, know, you and I get impatient when 10 minutes pass. Uh, so in a lot of ways, I think we need to be sympathetic with Abraham. It's just a long time to wait. Uh, and it, it is difficult to wait on God, but it can be disastrous when we don't wait on him. And so I think you know we need to bring, I, I know we need to bring everything in prayer before we move out to make sure that we're on his page. Then Abram had relations with Hagar and she conceived. When Hagar became aware that she had conceived, her mistress was insignificant in her sight. And that might be kind of confusing with all the hers there, but it is uh, Hagar looking at contempt upon Sarah, not the other way around. Uh, so we might say, what, what I read this as, Hagar's taking a victory lap here and kind of in your face, gloating, uh, kind of doing all that. Um, in a cultural context, what may be going on here, some commentators picked up, is she may have equated herself as a wife of equal standing with Sarai when she wasn't. She was in a lower social order. So in any case, this appears to be the first recorded love triangle. It just gets messy this way. Um, 
Um, perhaps this included a threat that Hagar was not going to give her son to Sarai as as what the agreement says it was going to be. So we don't know exactly what was said. However, uh, one thing that's kind of fun about Jewish tradition is whenever there are gaps, uh, Jewish commentators like to fill in the gaps. And Genesis Rabbah tells us what Hagar said, which I think is kind of kind of cute here. So this Sarai, her conduct, this is uh, Hagar talking, her, her conduct in secret is not like her conduct in public. She shows herself as if she is a righteous woman, but she is not a righteous woman, for she did not merit to conceive all these years, whereas I have conceived from the first union. So again, Hagar uh, gloating here, uh, rubbing it in Sarah's face. And again, the thought in that day was if you were childless, you you were you must be wicked. You must not be righteous. So she's kind of building on that. And so this, you know, these seemingly fanciful interpretations, you know, our, our Western mind wants to ask, you know, is this true? Um, the answer is probably not. Not, but that's not the point, right? Pastors uh, use illustrations in sermons today. I'm sure every one of those is not, you know, completely historically accurate. Uh, we like to fill in gaps with educated guesses and speculations. It's just that Jewish commentary allows for a lot more creativity in, in leeway uh, than than our seminaries do. So um, I like to think that the sages back then had a better grasp of the underlying context and meaning than we do today. So we we can, in any case, we can learn from this. I, I think it's interesting that that they uh, that they fill in the gaps like this. So Sarai is not happy, and, and you want to say, well, this was your idea, but that's how sin is, right? Sin, sin creates a mess. So Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be put on you. I put my slave woman into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was insignificant in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, look, your slave woman is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated Hagar harshly, and Hagar fled from Sarai's presence. I can actually see two sides to Abram's response. I'm not sure which one is right. Maybe elements of both are true. First, I can see, like Adam, um, Abram is the leader of the house, and he failed to lead his wife. He should have been more of a leader here. But second, also, if, if Hagar was acting uh, a little high and mighty, and acting like a full status wife, then Abram here is possibly doing the right thing by affirming that Hagar is still Sarai's subordinate. So again, you know, learning to see both sides uh, is something a Berean does. We just we just aren't aren't told, but it's, it's it's good to think of other alternatives. In either case, you know, think of Abram now, who's waited so long for a son, and now the mother of the son just left. <laughs> so the son that he's wanted so long and this procedure that they implemented um, is just backfiring in just about every respect. Uh, it says Hagar, Sarah Hagar was treated harshly by Sarah. Um, we, we aren't sure again if, if the subordinate acts up, then the superior has every right to deal with the situation. Um, but we, Sarah could also have been vindictive here, just <laughs> giving it back. Uh, we aren't sure. But we do, we do know the Jewish sages take Sarah's side in this entire ordeal. In fact, it's interesting they actually accuse Abram of stealing here. So how is that? And this is Genesis Rabbah 45. Sarai is talking to Abraham, saying, When you pray to God, what will you give me since I am going childless? You prayed only for yourself, whereas you should have prayed for both of us. Ouch. And I would have been remembered with you. Moreover, you are stealing from me. Ouch. Your protective words. For you heard my degradation and you remained silent. In other words, you are depriving me of the words you should have spoken to Hagar to reprimand her on my behalf. So you should have stuck up for me. So uh, again, again, we would see all this more like Abraham in this entire episode is failing to be the leader that uh, that he should have been. So our second walking in his dust Talmudim thought for this lesson, uh, we need to speak out in defense of someone who is being mistreated. Um, after reading the opinion about Abraham stealing from Sarah, Rabbi Polishkin says, if if failure to defend another person's honor is stealing, then we are obligated to speak up when we see someone being disgraced. Words of defense are due to a person being disgraced, and it is considered stealing to withhold them. So it's stealing by omission, by not speaking up, by being silent. Um, cowering in fear when boldness is called for. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And we looked at this in the gospel study when we talked about John the Baptist, when he said, I must decrease, 
so he must increase. We always put others above ourselves, and that's just how uh, we love our neighbor. Now the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah, slave woman. So he's the angel is reiterating Hagar's status here. From where have you come and where are you going? And she says, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. So this is the first mention of many of the angel of the Lord here. Um, the word for angel is the same in Hebrew as a natural human messenger. But I think here it's it's safe to assume the messenger of the Lord is definitely supernatural. Some would even speculate that the angel of the Lord is Jesus uh, in a pre-incarnate state. There are places where this could be the case. In fact, a lot of times where it could be the case, but there's other times where it doesn't seem to fit. Um, and uh, we'll get to those <laughs> later on. Um, as the, the messenger is an authorized representative, uh, the they use the first person, I. Uh, so we see this, they have every authority to speak on behalf of the Lord as, as if the same words came from the Lord himself. So it's kind of like uh, when a government ambassador is representing their king or uh, there's a corporal reading a message from a general, you know, th those words carry the same weight as if the person himself was there reading. In, in some cases, the lines become so blurry that it, you know it, that we transition from the angel of the Lord to it would appear God Himself is speaking. We'll see this in uh, in chapter eighteen. So it's kind of interesting to watch out for the the lines get blurred. The angel here again reinforces Hagar's position with respect to Sarah. Hagar. So the question is, where have you come from and where are you going? So Hagar answers the first question, but she doesn't answer the second. She is probably headed back to Egypt. Uh, which is where she is going. But spiritually, she doesn't know where she's going. She's lost. And in fact, her chances of making it alone while pregnant probably weren't all that good, right? She would be viewed by any society in that day as a woman with suspect morals. You know, what are you, what are you doing out here? How did you get pregnant? So um, it's curious that God intervenes to prevent her from leaving the promised land. Yet he could have done that, but didn't when Abraham went to Egypt. And this is just God's sovereign choice. So he wants to keep Hagar in the promised land, which is interesting. She's, she's kind of blocked from leaving. We'll see that again with, uh, with Isaac, but again, he doesn't do that with Abraham. So the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Those must have been harsh words for Hagar to hear. The angel of the Lord also said, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. And that is very true. The angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant. You will give birth to a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. So Yishima means he will hear, and then we have this, the suffix El, which means God. So God God will hear or God hears is what Ishmael means. And anyone who's read Moby Dick will recall the iconic opening line, call me Ishmael, uh, suggesting that you know the narr narrator himself in that book was wild and, and wandering and all that. Um, Ishmael, indeed, a great multitude today. He is the father of the Arabic people, many of whom were the first Gentile believers in Jesus, by the way. Um, Arabic Christians in the Middle East are actually among the most persecuted today. Jews tend not to like them because they're Arabs, and Muslims don't like them because they're Christians. So they're kind of caught in the middle and, and seen as, as betrayers all the way around. Again, return and submit to Hagar, a tough assignment given what Hagar has just experienced. Now, a dark prophecy here for the Ishmaelites, but he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against Everyone and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in defiance of all his brothers. So um, the father of the Arabic people is Ishmael, and the lines of Ishmael and Isaac's son Esau eventually become commingled, that they, they become one line. So um, according to Islamic tradition, Ishmael founded the holy city of Mecca. Uh, he and Abraham and Hagar moved there. Um, Abraham is said to nearly offer Ishmael, whereas in the Hebrew Christian Bible, uh, we would have Abraham offering Isaac. So a little bit different lines of tradition there. And so a lot of people point out that when we look at the history 
of Islam. Um, it, it is very violent. Uh, Muhammad is said to have el- eliminated many of his kinsmen. And even today, uh, the, the, the hand of the Sunni is against the hand of the Shia and, and vice versa. And their main disagreement is over which group is over the pure followers of, uh, of Muhammad. Um, so it said that uh, the the root word for uh, Islam is peace. Uh, there's salam in there, um, but it, it's more along the lines of pacify. So if we remember our Vietnam history, when we pacify a town, um, it's it's not exactly all that peaceful. Now um, the problem I have is that this verse has been used to disparage all Arabs and all Muslims. That's called racism, and that has no place in the mind, heart, or mouth of, of a believer in Jesus. Really, in, in our sin nature, all of our hands are against each other. We are only changed by the changed heart that comes through faith the Messiah. Uh, Jeremiah seventeen nine: the heart is more deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continuously. So, to take a verse like this out of context and uh, you know blast an entire race or ethnicity is is totally wrong. Um, now, uh, as Christians, do we have fundamental disagreements with Islam? Sure. Um, Islam has many f- disagreements with Christianity. Uh, on the outside of the Dome of the Rock in Arabic is actually a, a polemic, you know, anti, <laughs> there's anti-Christian uh, words there. You should have, should have one God, not three kind of thing. Um, Muslims, like all of us, are made in God's image. Uh, and in talking about the Jewish Muslim con- conflict, there's a Palestinian Christian that I, I listen to who likes to say, once you pick a side, you've lost because Jesus loves both people. And he, again, he's in the middle between uh, Jews and, and Muslims. So he has a very unique perspective. Uh, it's interesting. There are many reports of former Muslims coming to faith in Jesus and more than a handful of those. Uh, say they've had a Paul-like experience meeting with Jesus. And this is in countries where Jesus is illegal. So I, I find that interesting that you have the, the supernatural um, um, encounters with, uh, with Jesus and, and, and the, the convert rate, I guess you could say. Uh, many people are converting from Muslim to, to Christianity. Now, the social price these believers pay is high. Uh, they're almost always driven underground. And if word gets out, you know, at a minimum, they're cut off from their family. And in some situations, it's a capital crime. So definitely need to be praying for, for the Christians and the Muslims um, in, uh, in the Middle East and throughout the world. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees me. For she said, have I even seen him here and lived after he saw me? Therefore, the well was called Beer or well Lahai Roi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And we looked at those two towns on the map earlier. Hagar is probably stunned that uh, as a lowly servant, she would merit such supernatural favor. Yet, yet here we go. Um, El Roi is in Hebrew, the God who sees. And it's interesting that the the angel uses God's covenant name, but Hagar does not. Uh, so nationally, the Ishmaelites are not a party to God's covenant with Abraham and Isaac. Um, but it's interesting. I, I would suspect many, if not all, most of the foreigners who attached themselves to the camp of Israel were probably Arabic. Uh, there's this, this second category called the Ger Toshav, which means they, they are attaching them. So they're Gentiles who attach themselves to the camp. Um, and this area is in the Negev, in the wilderness, where the wilderness wanderings took place. So all of this is happening in the same general region. So Hagar bore a son to Abram, and Hagar named his son, to whom Hagar gave birth, Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. So as we said, uh, Hagar versus Sarah, um, Ishmael versus Isaac becomes a big theme for Paul in Galatians. Um and so we can read Galatians 4.22, for it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. So uh, it's a little bit tough to summarize this, but a lot of people say, you know, 
Paul is teaching Christianity versus Judaism, grace versus law, uh, you know, one's good, one bad. I think that's naive and overly simplistic. Um, in Acts 21 through 23, Paul identifies himself as a Torah observant Jew. He says, I am a Pharisee, not I was a Pharisee. So there's just a lot more going on here. The, ba- the main issue Paul's addressing is the same issue we struggle with today. The grace of God just seems too good to be true. So we feel we have to bring something in order to justify ourselves and that is called works righteousness and in some sense that is what abraham did when he went into sarah he wasn't content to wait on god he felt he had to do something and so paul is going to draw on this theme of the the son by the slave woman versus the the promise of the free woman so we come to jesus first and then our lives, including our behavior and our obedience, are transformed. So there's an order to things. The Isra- Israelites were freed from slavery, and then they were given the Torah. Uh, works righteousness was and is a perversion of God's gift. So it's not Judaism, but uh, Paul is really talking about the, the, the perverse, perverted application of Judaism into a works righteousness faith. And again, I think, you know, this, this happens in more churches today than, than we probably realize. Uh, but, uh, maybe not in word, but certainly indeed, there's things that you, you have to get right before you can come to God. You, you come to God first and then you get right and then He makes you right. So conclusion, um, God's servants are to trust his word, to wait for its fulfillment, and en- endure patiently until the end. That's the hard part, the waiting. As uh, Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. Um, Abraham certainly felt that. It becomes increasingly evident in Genesis that any person or nation that owes its existence to divine election needs to live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Um, human efforts will not help. Um, but the good news for God's people is that the living God sees and hears, and all that is from uh, Chuck Missler's commentary. And then I would add, don't sire any Ishmael. So I'll I'll tell a quick story. About 25 years ago, I I was telling my then pastor about an episode I had at my work. I had sent my boss the kind of email you, you mean only for one person to see and not anyone else, and that email eventually gets forwarded and then was seen by the very person who wasn't meant to see it. Um, and then things got a little tense. So as I'm telling the story, my pastor at the time grinned from ear to ear, and you had to know him. That was just kind of his style. He said, yep, when you typed the email, you sired an Ishmael. And at first I said, well, that's not funny. And then I said, well, that's actually a great phrase. Uh, and I've kind of used it ever since. So whenever we act in the flesh instead of the spirit, we sire an Ishmael. And, and Ishmael is just representative of that wild ass that becomes you know, virtually uncontrollable. And so the lesson all those years ago is, is when I tried to learn. There's nothing worse than not learning God's lesson the first time. And so we'll see that Abraham uh you know, he, he messes up here, but then as it goes on, he's, he's getting more and more walking into faith. And that's just how our, our, our lives are. Um, so the example of siring Ishmael, you know, applies to anything we do in the flesh. And so in that respect, Genesis 16 may be one of the most applicable chapters in the entire Old Testament for us today. And I'll close in a prayer here. God, please protect us from the pain and the destruction that comes from trusting in our flesh and abilities rather than trusting in you. And to that, we all say amen. So I'll see you next time for Genesis chapter 17.